going to give you an individual's view on machine to machine uh, and the Internet of Things. A number of things to just highlight. One is the extraordinary growth. I think all the estimates we've seen are extremely conservative. Uh, you only have to look at some of those areas like the U.S. auto industry, uh, which are beginning to embed this deeply to get a sense of scale. Uh, and I think it's in the trillions of sensors, not the billions, uh, which are sometimes talked about only by 2020. The second point to stress is declining cost. We've obviously seen that in radio frequency tagging, uh, and we've seen it in many other areas, but there will be a constant improvement in capability of manufacturing uh, and as well in the distribution and other systems. So I see declining cost as facilitating ubiquitous use in many, many, many different sectors which are currently still in the labs or experimental. Right around the piece, uh, whereas the domination has been in uh, auto and in some other sectors, I see the biggest growth coming in health appliances, in pharmaceuticals, uh, digestible wireless transmitters, a lot of interaction with uh, geriatric care, care of people that don't have full uh, control over their knowledge of what they're doing, so people with Parkinson's, <coughs> Alzheimer's, dementia. Uh, we will all want our elderly loved ones uh, to be wired uh, and to know when they're doing what, but we'd also want that for our kids uh, and we'll want it for our animals, uh, we'll want it everywhere. So total uh, sensor devices and of course we'll want it in the atmosphere to know what we're breathing uh, and we'll want it in our foodstuffs to know uh, that they haven't passed the expiration date and we'll want it in our heating for it to know what we're about to wake up and we'll want it in our cooling uh, and everywhere else. So. Ubiquitous devices, uh, clearly the interfaces will be uh, automated. That's why I prefer concepts of machine to machine uh, to, to those that are sometimes around about human interfaces. Interesting is always when can machines not do what you want them to do. And I have a great group in Oxford. So we have about 350 faculty in Oxford that are working on big mega trends of the future, doing a lot of lab work. So we're doing quantum computing. Uh, we're doing many things. But one of the most fascinating projects is the project we're doing on crowdsourcing, uh, on the handover between machines and humans and pushing the frontiers of machine intelligence and human intelligence. So how do you get the machines to make judgments? Uh, how do you teach them uh, habit? How do you embed uh, decision making in machine intelligence? But then how do you also get the machine to wake you up and tell you when you need to get involved as a human mind? And it turns out that there's a lot of learning in this area and there are still many, many things that humans can't do. So for example, our Galaxy Zoo project, which is a machine intelligence project identifying new galaxies, uh, has discovered more galaxies in recent years than the, in the previous 50 years by uh, developing algorithms which tell the people who are monitoring this when to look at a particular spin on a galaxy uh, to work out which way it's turning. And so 500,000 amateur astronomers around the world are now providing a crowdsourced free research assistant to do this. But it doesn't only apply to that. It can apply in many, many other areas. So the identification, early warning signals on pandemics. Uh, machines will tell you how many Kleenexes are being bought around the world or aspirin in a particular locality at a particular time, obviously geo-censored, uh, but they won't tell you uh, whether it was just because there was a a particular constellation of herding uh, that happened uh, or whether there's really a pandemic happening there. The same is true in finance. Uh, everything, of course, in finance is data rich. Uh, it is the most data intense of all the global systems, uh, much more than health, uh, much more than many others. And yet what we've seen in that is the inability to drink from the fire hydrant. So it was not the lack of data that led to the financial crisis. Uh, it was the lack of interpretation uh, or the failure to understand the structural shifts in the nature of that data. 
Uh, very interesting that you have the most sophisticated bodies uh, in the world playing with this data. IMF, BIS, Fed Reserve, SEC, uh, and all of them in the UK, the Bank of England and Treasury. These are the most sophisticated institutions uh, in our arsenal to interpret data. Complete failure uh, to interpret it. So what happens? How do you interpret breaks? How do you understand nodes and networks? Complexity, uh, and how do you drink from the fire hydrant of data is absolutely essential. Developing machines that are able to feed to you the interpretations uh, of abnormality becomes increasingly uh, significant. So this handoff between human and machine intelligence becomes more and more important as the machine networks become deeper, more complex, and become the nervous system. So when a machine is operating your body uh, or interfacing with your body, you really want to make sure uh, that the handover to you is right or the handover to the experts if that's the if it's someone who's not in full control uh, is, is absolutely right and that is true generally uh, of the sensor network structure so security becomes uh, important as well that one big headline is machine human handover as a crucial variable and how do you develop it the other is integrity of systems and security this is everything from the physical integrity to make sure the system operates effectively. With, we know that there's the distribution uh, of failure of machine parts. This is a manufacturing uh, as well as other errors that lead to that. So we know that there's machine failure inherent. And the more machines you have, the more failure you will have. Uh, but we also know that there's a whole lot of other reasons uh, related to um, interfaces related to energy disruption, related to uh, corruption uh, of various forms, and of course criminal, cyber, and other threats that lead to machine failure. So there's a very wide range of reasons why machines may fail or be insecure or lead to corrupted outcomes or misleading outcomes, uh, which could be disastrous. And we know that we don't know how to fix them typically because uh, they're much too complex for us to understand and diagnosing them is extremely difficult, at least for ordinary people. It requires expert intervention uh, and generally the replacement uh, of components. So ensuring the integrity of the system is paramount. That means cybersecurity becomes more and more significant uh, in, in its various different dimensions. It means the trusted nature of the system becomes more and more significant. And the, the one thing I worry about, I'm incredibly optimistic about the rollout of uh, IoT, uh, machine intelligence, but I am very worried about reputational risk early. If there are some disasters in these initial years, they could set back the progress a very long way. Uh, and certainly when it comes to human machine interfaces, uh, like in medical applications, uh, this could be a, a very significant problem. Or if a number of cars uh, smash uh, while they have machine intelligence interfaces uh, in, while they're driving and it leads to some failure to insure, et cetera, one could imagine the thing being set back by a very long way. So ensuring the integrity is extremely important. Unfortunately, there's not enough attention paid to the whole cyber world. Uh, it, there's lots of dimensions, of course, of machine intelligence, which we know are being revealed now uh, in the latest uh, Snowden and other NSA revelations. Much of that is machine-machine uh, intelligence that's driving that. But this is the tip of an iceberg. And how we trust these networks and how we trust the integrity is crucial. So greater focus uh, not only on encryption, but physical security, integrity, uh, ensuring uh, that these things are not uh, hijacked uh, by pirates of various types uh, in, in the virtual world is going to be absolutely crucial in that. That's why it's a great responsibility, I think, for everyone in the room as they're thinking about this. This is early stage pioneering, uh, and it's extremely important in early stage pioneering to make sure uh, that you think through the different trends. All these future trends on managing this planet with another 2 billion people over the next 20 or so years, increasingly hyper-connected, lead to extraordinary release of energy. This will be like the internet and computerization was in the previous generation, extraordinary source of wealth, 
of opportunity, of progress, of improved lives, uh, health around the world. Uh, that's the upside. The downside is, of course, there will be massive disruptive change. Creative destruction will happen at a more rapid pace than previously. People will lose their jobs. Uh, there will be certainly unintended cascading risks that result from hyperconnectivity. How we manage those and how society perceives them so it doesn't start over-regulating, rejecting change, uh, slamming the doors of progress shut and seeing the technological change as a threat rather than opportunity is going to be absolutely crucial. So a big responsibility to try and think through these things, not only from a technological business profit-seeking uh, perspective, but also from the perspectives of politics, economics, ethics, uh, and other dimensions which are all embedded in this. So my hope is that we can have many more of these conversations because it's exactly these sorts of conversations which are going to pioneer the way uh, for massive progress in the future. Thank you very much.